Um, it was our week to sing this week, and we had really actually planned just not to sing. We, we didn't really feel like we had one um, prepared and that it was something that we ought to do. Um, but as we, on, our way to, um, on, on our way here this morning, we were singing this in the, um, in the van on the way here, and I just thought that this would be a wonderful way to call us to worship. So first off, as you, as you sing these words, this is Jesus' words to us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Um, so, first off, it is a message to the congregation that we ought to be doing that. But secondly, it is also our prayer. This is why we come on Sunday, because we are choosing to seek Him first in all His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto us. Um, so, you sing along with us um, as, we, as we sing. If you'll give us a, a note. Let's begin this morning with a time of prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are, um, that you've, you've asked us to seek you. That you've not made yourself difficult for us to find, that as we come to you, you, you reveal yourself to us. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we have come this morning to do just that, to seek your face, to know your will. Guide and direct our steps, Lord. May your name be exalted as we praise the holiness of who you are and all that you've done in our lives. Be exalted in us, Lord, this morning. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thirty-eight in your hymn books at Calvary. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yeah. 
Number 140 down at the cross. <coughs> Number 140. <coughs> down at the cross when my Savior died. Down for the cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood. Pages number 142, there is a fountain. Number 142.
may be here.
At this time, we're going to say a prayer for our offering. And uh, just remember Annie Armstrong. We've got plates at the front, plate at the back. We're not going to pass them yet. So just remember this, Kurt. We'll turn with me to Acts chapter, chapter 8. And kids, I want to start this morning with um, kind of a word picture for you to think about. Okay? I was going to do this, but um, I didn't want Wayne to have to vacuum it all up. So I want you to imagine, how do you scatter seed? How do you do it? You, what, you, what do you do? You have, you have a bag full of seed, right? You put your hand in there, and you get it, and what do you do? You throw it. Now, that seed, it starts off being nice and comfortable and all together, and it ends up being everywhere. Okay? And yet, there's a biblical picture here. Matter of fact, um, if you want to hold your finger here in 1 Corinthians, or sorry, in, in Acts 8, I, I'm going to read a couple of passages in 1 Corinthians. Paul refers to um, this idea of being seed, of seed being thrown in, in several different ways. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The first way has to do with dying. This is what Paul says. He says, if someone, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? Okay, so you hear what the question is. Paul is concerned for people that are out there that are saying, okay, I know that there's going to be death. I know that happens. And I even believe there's going to be a resurrection. But what will the resurrected person look like? And this is what Paul says. You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. That idea of throwing seed, of scattering seed, that's called sowing. That's how you plant. And what he tells us is that the seed that goes into the ground doesn't look anything like the plant that comes out of the ground. What you sow is not, uh, does not come to life unless it dies. And, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as He has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but um, there is one kind for humans, and another for animals, and another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. 
The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. As is the man of heaven, so also those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born in the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Okay, so what this is telling us is that when we die, when we rise again, our bodies are not going to look like this anymore. Just like if you were to take a wheat seed, it looks like this little piece of wheat, you plant it in the ground, you cover it up, and it dies, kind of. It's under the ground. And then what happens is something comes up out of that. It comes through the ground, and you get this big, long plant that is so different than that little bitty seed. And Paul says that's exactly how it is with us. What is sown is perishable. That means it dies. What is raised is imperishable. That means it won't die. And he even goes on to say there's two types of people. There are those that are sown in Adam alone, and there are some who are, who are raised with Christ. So there's a difference between before and after. Okay? Paul talks about this in a little bit of a different way in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Sorry, chapter 3, verse 4. Now he was dealing at the beginning of this book with a couple of people that were arguing. Okay? There was the church of Paulus, there was the church of Paul, and there was the church of Jesus Christ. Three different churches. And they all said, I follow Apollos, and I follow Paul. And Paul was frustrated about that. And this is what he had to say. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. All right, this is what Paul's saying. The church is kind of like the field. Okay? And Paul and Apollos, they did a good job. Paul did some planting. And after he planted, Apollos came back and watered. But how did it grow? God is who made it grow. Okay? Now, we're going to go back to that seed. You are kind of like a little seed. Okay? You'll be planted. Now, what the world wants you to think is that what's going to happen is what comes from inside of you will sprout up. That's not really the best way to think about it. The best way to think about it is what God puts in you will sprout and come up. There's a big difference. You're going to grow. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because this morning we're going to look at what looks like a bad thing. Matter of fact, those of you that were in the adult Sunday school class this morning, we talked about how God, there was a straightforward path to go to Canaan, and God didn't take the straightforward path. Instead, he took them into a place and got them all boxed in and got them in trouble, and then he rescued them. He didn't take them the easy way. And we're going to see something kind of similar. Matter of fact, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I was actually going to have some of our Bible drill folks did that. So, kids, if you were in Bible drill, if you know Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you're going to say it in King James. I don't have it in front of me, so you have to help me. Um, help me start. <laughs> Alana offered me a Bible just that quick. Well, you could. Um, that's fine. I'll do that. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Kids, those of you that have been working on it. Oh, it is difficult. Okay. Say it in your heads. <laughs> and I'll, I'll read it. That's what happens when I try to do things on the fly. It doesn't work. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When we first started studying the book of Acts, I told you that this verse might be the theme verse of the entire book. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, 
and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now what have the apostles been told to do? Be witnesses. Where? Starting in Jerusalem, spreading to Judea, moving from there to Samaria, and from there to the ends of the earth. And you know where we find them? In Acts chapter 8? Jerusalem. And there is a wonderful church in Jerusalem, but they have not gone to Samaria and the ends of the earth. Maybe, maybe they've gone to Judea. Okay, I have a map up there, and um, just very quickly so we know where Samaria is. Um, it's, it's cut off at the very bottom, but if you see that little circle at the very bottom of the screen, that's the city of Jerusalem, okay? And Jerusalem is in, you can kind of think of it as the state of Judea, okay? It's actually like a little, little nation, but something like that, okay? So Jerusalem is in Judea. So what Jesus was saying is, start in Jerusalem, go out to Judea. From there, go to, if you notice above, there's a, sit, there's a, a state above it, if you will, kind of another little nation, and that's called Samaria. And these borders are not exact, but they'll just give you kind of an idea. And then up above Samaria, you can see Galilee, right? And at Galilee, you can see the Sea of Galilee. Jesus spent a lot of time there. Nazareth is up there in Galilee, okay? So what Jesus is saying is Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And yet where we find the believers in Acts chapter 8 is Jerusalem still. What happened in Acts chapter 7 was a wonderful sermon by Stephen. We talked about that last week. A man mighty in power and in spirit. And they, the, the chief priests and the leaders of the Jews did not like him, and so they, they stoned him. And the sermon ended with him being interrupted. With the, it says they plugged their ears and they rushed at him and they took him out and they stoned him. And then we read in chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he, was dra he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, normally when you read this passage, I bet your first thought has been, oh, those poor Christians. And I still read this, and I, there's a part of me that hurts for these Christians. It is not their fault. Matter of fact, we talked a little bit about this last time. One of the hardest things about Stephen is that it's kind of like Stephen caused this. Stephen preached such a great sermon that all the Christians were attacked. But do you see what happened? They were scattered. And if you remember that picture of taking seed and just kind of throwing it out there, that scattering seed, that sowing seed, and what God does here is God allows His people to be scattered. He's the one who did that. And maybe by now, since we just got reading Acts 1.8, now that you read, where were they scattered? Judea and all of Samaria. They went from Jerusalem. God took, if you will, the seeds of His message that were all living in Jerusalem. God picked them up and allowed them to be scattered through all Judea and Samaria. Now they're spread out. And it's a great persecution. It is no fun. <laughs> But for the last several weeks, we've talked about the no fun part. Today, we get to talk about the fun part. The first point I want you to realize this morning is we are sown to be witnesses. God scattered them or allowed them to be scattered, but there was a purpose in why He did that. Matter of fact, I, I want to back up, kind of keep your finger here, but I want to back up to John chapter 4. You're probably familiar with this story, but I want to put it in, in context because we're about to read about Philip going to a particular city in the state, in the area of Samaria. Okay? Philip is a deacon. Okay? He's one of those that was ordained as a deacon in chapter 6, and now he has been scattered. He's been sent out, and he comes to a particular city. We'll get to it in a minute in Samaria. But before we talk about Philip, I want to back up really probably not all that many years. 
at most four. I mean, we're not talking a long time. Just a few years ago. And we have Jesus. He's still in the middle of his ministry. And in John chapter 4, we hear what's happening in Jesus' ministry. John chapter 4, verse 1. Now when Jesus learned the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. Can you put that map back up there? You hear what's happening? He's, a lot of his ministry had to do with Jerusalem. He had been in Judea, okay? The, um, the gray area in the middle, that is the Jordan River Basin, okay? So the Jordan River actually runs from the Sea of Galilee up at the top, straight down that grayish area, and then runs into the Dead Sea down there at the bottom, okay? And he was, he was in the area of Judea, just outside of Jerusalem, over there by the river, baptizing, People were coming to him. The, the Pharisees, the, the leaders that came from Jerusalem, they found out that Jesus was doing well. And so because of that, Jesus decides to leave Judea and go back up to Galilee. Now you have to understand, there were a lot of Jews in Judea. There were a lot of Jews in Galilee. But there were mm, some... I guess maybe we could call them half-breeds. That's not a very popular word. And it's not a very popular idea. But these are people who were half-Jews that lived in that area in the middle. They were called Samaritans. Okay? And Samar uh, Samaria was not a place that Jews liked to go. Okay? So if you had to go from Galilee to Judea, what you normally did is you went west, east. That's east. You went east out there in the wilderness, and you went up through the wilderness so you didn't have to go past those nastiest Samaritans. But we find Jesus going through Samaria, and he ends up at a city called Sychar. Now Sychar, I have it highlighted there if you can see it. It's right there kind of on top of a, of a mountain. There's a pretty big mountain right there next to it that actually comes into the story, but we won't, we won't talk about that today. Um, and you remember, as he came... Um, he was departing Galilee, verse 3. Verse 4, he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given his son Jacob. Those of you that remember as we're going through Genesis, this location is actually in um, Succoth, where Jacob first pitched his booth. He, made, he pitched a tent there when he was finally at home in Canaan. Anyway, that's, um, that's where they're at. Okay. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from the journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. And you probably remember this story. A woman from Samaria came out to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for, me, ask a, for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Okay, so Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Men have no dealings with women. And so this is a very odd thing. And so we have Jesus. Notice, why is Jesus on his way? Why is he in Samaria? He has been somewhat chased out of Judea. The Pharisees found out that he was doing well there. And so he was somewhat escaping. Now I think his words were, my time has not yet come. Okay, so he's not running scared, he's running because it's not yet time. But he is leaving Judea to go to Galilee, and as he goes, he goes through Samaria, he ends up in the city called Sychar, and when he's there, he meets the woman at the well. And you probably remember the story. Jesus says, give me a drink. She says, why are you asking me for a drink? And he said, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink. And she said, you don't have a pitcher, and the well is deep, so how could you give me a drink? And he said, I can give you living water. And she said, oh, I would love this living water so I don't have to come out here. And he says, okay, where's your husband? She says, well, I don't really have a husband. And he says, you're right. You've been married several times, and the man you're shacking up with isn't your husband. And she says, where should we worship? <laughs> we'll change the subject. <laughs> he gets her back on subject. She goes out back to the village and she brings a bunch of people out and the disciples come back and they find him talking with a woman. And this is what, what they say. Verse 27. Just then 
His disciples came back. They marveled to see that he was talking with the woman, but no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So they went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples bright fellows that they were, said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? All right, all of of a sudden Jesus is moving to the same picture that I was just describing, that of seed being planted, of it growing up, and then there being a harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for our harvest. Already the one who is reaping is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor." Many Samaritans from the town, from that town, believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After two days, he departed and went to Galilee. All right. Now, this is important for what we're about to read in Acts chapter 8. The city of Sychar is about seven miles from the city of Samaria. Okay? We're not talking about a long, long way away. We're talking about right next door. It is my opinion that when Jesus stayed for two days in the city of Sychar, the Samaritans from the surrounding region, not just the city of Sychar, came to him and heard him teach. Many of them had already believed in him. This is before his crucifixion, this is before his resurrection, and this is before the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that comes in Acts chapter 2. Jesus has already been to Samaria, and as he did it, it was because he was being chased by Gentiles, persecution, and he had already given them the gospel. Now, fast forward three years later or so, something like that, we now find Stephen dead. We find um, the disciples, the, the church of Jerusalem, scattered. They're literally running for their lives, living in other places. And Philip, one of the deacons, ends up in the city of Samaria. If you'll go back to the map one more time, I'll be finished. So he leaves Jerusalem, and he goes, and his new home is now apparently Samaria. That's where he is. Okay, you can see it. It's just not very far at all. This is the city of Samaria inside the state of Samaria. Okay, New York, New York, it's that kind of thing. Okay, so that's what's happening here. Acts chapter 8, and you can turn there and we'll be there the rest of the morning. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs he did, for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so that there was much joy in the city. I want you to notice that God scattered, or he at least allowed, the believers to be scattered. And notice what they went. As they went... There are very few things I think would be more instructive for us to realize is that we have a job to do as we are going. There are some people that think, you know, I need to go on a mission trip because when I go on a mission trip, it'll be a good time for me to be a missionary. And I'm saying to you, as you are going, you are a missionary. 
A mission trip is wonderful. I, I strongly recommend it. But don't think that's the only place that you're supposed to be serving God. You're supposed to be serving God all the time, wherever you go. Philip was chased out of his hometown, and yet as he went, he was preaching the gospel. Matter of fact, that's the next phrase. They preached the word. There is an idea in American Christianity that the way you grow a church is those of you who are not preachers, you go out and you try to fool non-Christians into coming to church. See if you can trick them into coming. And when they come, let's hope the, the preacher will preach something that the Spirit will speak to them. And, and you know, sometimes it works that way. There have been times that people hear the message here and they are convicted of their sin and they are drawn. But you know what the pattern in, in biblical churches is? Is that we as the church are preaching as we are going. Okay? There are the times that the Apostle Paul, or sorry, the Apostle Peter stood up and preached to a large crowd. But there are also the times that Philip, who was just a working deacon in the church, yet as he was going, he was proclaiming the Word of God. And that's effective. And that's how you ought to be living. living. Matter of fact, you might be saying, I am in a job that I really wish I wasn't in. God, why are you leaving me in this job? You might even be saying, you know, there is nobody around me that's a Christian. I am all alone. I am entirely separated from any kind of positive influence. Maybe you're there just like a seed is separated from all the other seeds to be a witness right where it's at. Maybe God has scattered you on purpose so that as you go, you preach the word. Don't encourage you to do that. Not only did they preach the word, but it specifically says that as Philip came to the city of Samaria, that he proclaimed Christ. He preached Christ. Sometimes you might be told that being a good witness is just, you know, holding doors for people. And holding doors for people is a good thing. Being the first one willing to clean up a spill and the most chivalrous, those are all wonderful things. But witnessing is telling people about who Jesus is. You know what's amazing? I don't know Philip's story about where he was when Jesus was alive or what was going on. But I bet he was a little surprised. In three years, Jesus spent two days in Samaria. That's not a long time. But what he did is he prepared the way so that when Philip comes... There's this marvelous turning to Christ that Jesus had been preparing years ahead of time. Can you imagine? Again, in your life, could it be that the place that you've been put, that you think you're so separated from everyone else, you've been put there and you don't even know that God has been preparing people to hear His Word from you in that spot. He has already been working. That was definitely true in Philip's life. Uh, what happened with the people is a miracle. Notice there are two things they did. When they heard him, this is in verse 6, and when they saw the signs, they heard and they saw. Now you don't have to turn here, but in Luke 8, Jesus is, um, has just given the parable of the sower, the one who sows the four different types of seed. And the, the disciples... The scholars that they were came to him afterward and said, uh, Lord, could you explain it to us? And this is what Jesus says to them. When his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Jesus is the one who said that. There are some people that hear but don't hear, and see but don't see. And so I give them my message in parables, so that they'll see but they won't see, and they'll hear but they won't hear. 
So it's important that we understand that these people in Samaria both saw and heard. They, they understood it. Matter of fact, Jesus goes on and he talks about four, four different types of soil. I won't go through them all this morning um, as far as explaining all their meanings, but there are some that fell by the path and the birds ate them up. There are some that fell in the rocky soil and they grew up quickly and then they died off because they had no root. There are some that fell among thorny ground and they grew up, but then thorns grew up and choked them out. And then there's a fourth kind. And the fourth kind of seed is that which fell among good ground. And Jesus said of that, as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast with an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. This is a description of the Samaritans. They heard and held on to it. The people heard and saw. Then we read that they were healed. There were unclean spirits that were driven out, and there were many who were paralyzed or lame that were healed. God is a healer, and when his gospel came to this area, he changed them. And that led to the final thing, there was joy. That's the encouragement I want you to hear this morning. The encouragement this morning is even when we're scattered, it ends in joy. You might look at Philip and say, poor guy, he he's a refugee. He had to run from his home. He had to leave his everything. He probably lost a lot of wealth. And yet he shows up in a new city. People accept Christ. What happens is the city is filled with joy. I'm only halfway finished, and I'm looking at the time. I tell you what, we're going to stop here. So if you're going to keep your outline, in two weeks we'll be back to it. <laughs> um, but as I'm, as I'm, <laughs> the message this morning is a message of encouragement. It could be that in your life, there's some sort of craziness happening. But God doesn't make mistakes. We were talking about the nation of Israel and how God did not take them directly to the land of Canaan. Instead, he took them where they were between hills. And the, the armies of Pharaoh came after them, and now they're boxed in with hills on either side, the, the Red Sea on one side, and the, the Egyptian army on the other. And God brought them there. Why? So that he could open up the Red Sea and demonstrate his power so that that passage ends, that the people feared the Lord because they saw his great power. I pray an awful lot harder when there's a crisis than I do when there's not. And yet, God loves me so much that he puts me into crisis so that I'll learn to lean on him like I ought to. The story of a seed is that it goes into the dirt and it dies. The story of us as Christians, when we give God ourselves, we give him everything, our life. But it doesn't end with the dead kernel in the ground. It ends with the resurrection. Let me end <laughs> this morning where we begin, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. I hear you turning. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 43 now. 
It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Verse 49, just as, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. The last few Sundays have been strong in that we learn that the Christian life requires us sometimes to go through persecution. But understand this, that even the call for persecution is tempered with the recognition that God raises us up no matter what. His name is lifted up. His word goes forth. If you're a believer, as you live your life this week, you be the witness that God has called you to be. If you're not a believer, maybe you're here this morning, and I don't take any credit, but maybe you're here this morning and you realize that God has been working on you that he's planted the word in you. That sermon that Jesus preached said there were those four kinds of soil and the birds are the ones who are attacked by Satan. The ones on the rock are the ones who um, have no root. The other ones get carried away with the cares of life. My encouragement to you is you be that fourth soil that hears the word and accepts it and lets it go into them and change you. Let's stand and sing. Number 307. encourage you to be here this evening. We'll be talking about Acts chapter 6, looking at the, the seven that were uh, appointed, as well as just considering, continuing con to consider leadership. So we'll be talking about elders, or overseers, or pastors, or stewards. All of those words we talked about last week are, are similar. And we'll also be talking about the role and office of deacon this evening. Um, for the next few weeks, we'll be having a time of testimony in the evening. I'd really encourage you to, to hear. Um, Gerald was going to give his testimony this evening, but he's not going to be able to, to make it tonight. Pray for him. Um, he's, he fell earlier this week and is still recovering, so, um, so pray for him. Um, so Johnny, even though he was not up this week, he's not up till next week, he's, he said he's willing to, um, to give his testimony tonight. So I'm, I'm very excited. I, I'm excited to hear his testimony. And um, I hope you're encouraged these weeks. I, I love listening how God has redeemed us. Um, so I'd encourage you to be here, here this evening for that. Is there a word this, this morning? Yeah. Um, I've... It seems like on the news we've heard a lot about COVID getting worse again, that there's been kind of an increase, and we're kind of in that time of year, the flu time of year. 
um, there was a, a message that came from our friends in India that things in India right now are not doing well at all. There's been a, a huge increase in the number of people that have died because of COVID. Um, there's not good medical care. The full nation is on lockdown again. Is that right? Not yet? Okay. But it's looming. And um, it's very, when we go on lockdown, we have to order out. When they go on lockdown, they can't leave their house. And some of them starve to death because they can't go to work. It is not good. Okay, from COVID? David Woods. David Woods. Okay, pray for David Woods. He's a pastor, um, good friend of, of Paul's. Yeah, yeah. I, um, Roy and Teresa's son in law, Matthew, has really struggled with recovering from COVID. They, it's been, they were pretty, it's been, what, nine months? Probably. It's been a long time since he's had it, but he still is not doing well at all with recovering from it. Any others? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, may your name be exalted and lifted up in all the earth. Thank you that you redeemed us. Lord, thank you that you have scattered us. As hard as that is, and help us to learn to be joyful in all that happens, that your name would be glorified, that you would heal the nations you would get the glory for the harvest. Help us to be faithful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.